Thank you. Thank you, Delia. Um, so I'm going to put you on first as we just discuss. So welcome, welcome everyone to our session on prospects for a scientific systemic synthesis. Uh, those of you who've run across me before know that I'm the eternal optimist in our society. I think th exciting things are happening and they're going to be more exciting in the years to come. Um, we've waited a long time for system science to start making its, its mark in society. But I think the wedge has gone in and things are starting to happen right now and we can see the beginnings of good work that is making significant traction within academia and in practice. So we want to give you some examples of that today. So we've brought together a group of people from different areas of work. And you'll see this does not just cover system science, which is our central interest, but it represents the broader belief that if you're going to make this work, we have to develop a complete discipline here. We have to develop systemology so that we have science, we have research, we have methods, we have philosophy. Um, and across the board, we have to be, across the board, we have to be successful uh, within academia and within society. So the group of people we've got here today will each tell you about the work that they are doing, uh, which I think is leading the field in their areas. And they're going to put it in context to show you how it is, it is creating the beginnings uh, of a widespread adoption of, of these techniques and methods and insights. Uh, the first one up is uh, Bill Schindel, who's going to present his S-star model, which is a, a general scientific model of systems that he's applying very successfully in systems engineering. Uh, thank you, Bill. Well, good morning. Still morning, I think, anyway. Uh, as, as David said, we're going to talk about uh, a particular framework that we're using in the system engineering world to represent uh, especially large complex systems and families of systems. Uh, it's called the S-star meta model. And to put it in context a little bit, we'll talk about some things very related to the themes that are we've heard through the earlier part of this week. I've been really impressed. This is my first. Uh, time at the ISSS, although I'm happy I've known some of you in the past through NCOSI. Um, so I'm really impressed with the diversity of views here and your tolerance for them, and I'm going to test that probably a little bit. So, uh, And I believe we're going to have a, an afternoon session after lunch where there'll be an opportunity to uh, come back at us a little bit. So I especially want to encourage people to plan to come to that and uh, have some questions. There are uh, about six points I want to make to you briefly about this meta model, uh, and we'll see if we can uh, squeeze them in here uh, briefly individually. Just to say a word about uh, the, the viewpoint this is coming from, I am a, a died-in-the-world system engineer for a long time, at over 40 years. All my work has been in the business world of uh, engineering systems, uh, in most cases through companies that I've started that are in systems businesses uh, after an apprenticeship and across a lot of different uh, domains in, in uh, communication systems and healthcare and automotive and telecom and a number of different areas. And these days, particularly in advanced manufacturing and uh, uh, healthcare and medical systems. Uh, the last 20 years or so, uh, my company, which is a spin out from a, a, an engineering school in the Midwest, I'm from Indiana, uh, has been practicing something called pattern-based system engineering That's uh, we practice openly uh, with partners in NCOSI and a wor working group called the Patterns Working Group. Uh, some of you uh, might have an interest in. After you find out about it a little bit, we'd invite you to, to join us. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the work that uh, Rick described this morning in the Agile area, we try to support and uh, are big cheerleaders of that as well. Uh, NCOSI is going through, and the system engineering practice is going through a big change in recent years, and I'll try to convey that to you a little bit as it relates to these uh, these ideas. Um, it, the relationship between NCOSI and the IEEE has been really important to us. As you, as you may know, we have a, a formal memorandum of understanding between the groups of some years back. Some of you helped contribute to making, putting that in place. Uh, we have a system science working group within NCOSI that some of you are a member of, and that's how I got to know uh, David and John Kinneman and, and uh, Len Troncalli and Jennifer Wilby. So very happy to be uh, here today for the first time, and I uh, hope you all continue to join us in ECOSI as well. 
the phase change that's going on in system engineering has got to do with really the underlying paradigm of how we carry it out. System engineering, as it's usually recognized in the most uh, uh, typical senses, is about a 60-year-old, 50- or 60-year-old practice. Uh, and in that sense, it's not as old as the other engineering disciplines. Uh, and, and it especially differs from them in a, a way that I think is per pertinent to what we'll talk about today and also maybe to the history of the IEEE too. The other engineering disciplines, for the most part, uh, mechanical and chemical and civil and the like, were uh, started and were connected very tightly to respective uh, uh, scientific disciplines in uh, mechanics and chemistry and, and uh, other areas and, and to the phenomena and the sciences that went with them. That's not how system engineering got started as a recognized practice. It was started for some other reasons having to do with the complexity of systems becoming overwhelming somewhere around the mid 20th century. And so if you look at the way that system engineering is carried out today uh, and the trends in that, the, this, the slide picture here kind of gives an idea, although it's not to scale, the large blue box on the outside, if you think of this as a Venn diagram, it's populated by all the practitioners of system engineering. There's about 10,000 system engineers in NCOSI, and then of course there's lots of other systems engineers in the world as well, such as many of you, uh, and they're somewhere out in that blue box. A, a portion of them or in the next box inside, carrying out system engineering by model-based methods. It's called model-based system engineering. And if we drew this to scale, it would be a very small box because uh, the majority of all system engineering is still not model-based at this moment. It just happens to be the fastest growing part of system engineering. If this was a dynamic picture, that the, most, the highest growth rate would be in the MBSE box. There are a variety of ways people carry out model-based system engineering. And so the one I'm going to talk to you about is using something called systematic methodology or S-star methodology that uses a particular meta model. And so it's a subset and one of uh, more than one of the model-based movement. And then special within that and particularly important, we think, in the scientific area is pattern-based system engineering. We're really concerned with not only models, but models that re express recurring themes of the sort that we discover through the scientific process. And that's uh, uh, somewhat newer yet. Many people that practice model-based methods in system engineering, and there's a, a growing number of them, it's growing rather rapidly even though it's still a minority, think of the foundations of it in terms of the information technologies that are used to support model-based methods. And there are tool sets and international standards and industry standards of, of, and, this, and the sort. And so some of those have underlying frameworks that, are, that grew out of the software movement and the information technology world and really are a, a, maybe a sound information technology basis, but they don't represent fundamental ideas necessarily about uh, the natural world. And that's a transition that we're in the process of making uh, right now and why these meta model discussions are so important. So we're still at flux, but more and more, as David pointed out, we're turning to what the roots are in science of these underlying model frameworks we use to, to represent systems. And the S meta model figures into that uh, particular framework. So we're not going to spend the time today in the short time going through lots of things about this meta model, but there's two aspects of it that David coached me a little bit about would be perhaps of particular interest. So the, the diagram uh, on, the, uh, on the right side there represents the notion of some of the major categories of information in this meta model. This is by no means a, what a model of a large-scale system would look like, but rather it's looking behind the, under the covers at what some of the underlying concepts are and how they're related to each other and, and the things that we would say are the, the minimal ideas re represented. A meta model, after all, is an underlying relational framework of the minimum set of ideas necessary for, in our case, for engineering or science purposes, for systems. And S, meta mo S models are any models of a system, perhaps this, uh, this conference, for example, that conforms to the S meta model, that uses the ideas from it. It's agnostic as to modeling language because there's a lot of contemporary and, and some older as well uh, system modeling languages. And there are increasingly third, uh, third party commercial tools for this kind of thing, uh, some of which are uh, commercial, some of which are in the public domain. Uh, it's agnostic as to those as well because this is really about, this underlying meta model is about nature, not uh, information technology or tools. And it, so it maps into all of them. In particular, we're interested in model-based methods that support the construction of patterns, which are nothing more than models of recurring ideas that happen again and again with some variant aspects 
especially those that would arise through a discovery process, such as Rick has described this morning in the Agile space, or that you might have if you're studying, uh, let's say, uh, farms or agriculture or some other area. Uh, patterns are the way we record in models what we've uh, found out about. Uh, many of the patterns that we operate with otherwise we call dark patterns, which simply represents the idea that uh, the way we used to do system engineering is uh, I've been around 25 years in the automotive market and I know a lot about cars. And so that it's deeply into my uh, uh, capabilities as a system engineer and that's a respected uh, bit of in intuition and, and experience and we make use of it. However, if a, if a new person arriving wants to make use of it, they, they better work at my side for a good many years for them to learn it. The patterns we're talking about are explicit models uh, called S patterns and they help us get around that a bit. Since we're not really gonna look at a lot of models today, I thought I'd just show you a quick slide that just has some extracts of the way some people represent these models. There really are all kinds of different visual ways to, do, to represent them and what we're more interested in this talk are what are the underlying concepts not how they're rendered, uh, such as these beautiful pieces of artwork on, this, on the side walls here, for example. We're really talking about what the underlying concepts are, and that's what I'll try to stick to today. But for your information, most of them are visual in some way, or tabular, uh, as opposed to the way we did system engineering representations of systems in the past, which was in prose. And it's just, it's hard to do orbital mechanics in prose, so models have some, uh, some benefits for us. The patterns we're talking about, S patterns, have been used for a few decades now across a good many domains. So they're used in, in representing systems in medicine, in vehicles, in uh, healthcare, uh, strange things like sp space tourism, uh, mill aero areas, uh, education, and even in the agile systems processes that uh, we're supporting Rick Dove that he spoke about this morning. And in COSI, we have several working groups that are involved in this. The patterns working group is the primary support of this, but we work jointly with other working groups in our professional society, including Rick's Agile Systems Working Group and the Product Line Engineering Working Group and the System of Systems Working Group, several of which you've heard about this morning from the other speakers. There are multiple hierarchies involved, even though we're trying to always represent the smallest possible model of a system. It's quite important in driving this meta model, is asking ourselves the question 30 years ago, what's the smallest possible model of a system sufficient for purposes of engineering, system engineering in particular. Those hierarchies include the kinds of hierarchies we're used to thinking about most often in engineering, containment hierarchies, wherein we build up bigger systems out of smaller ones, but also, very importantly with patterns, uh, generalization hierarchies, where we look at types of things and we get economic leverage out of classes of systems as well. We're gonna talk just very briefly about two parts of this meta model that I think run through all the discussions I've heard this week in, in IEEE's. One is about features, stakeholder features, which model system purpose or value or fitness, and from the perspective of stakeholders, which are almost always subjective and conflicting, and one of the most interesting parts of these models because they really represent the richness of the kind of, well, the discussion we just had about light bulbs, for example, and alternate lighting schemes, where we know that the, the stakeholder territory in the fitness space is really quite complex, and full of uh, uh, conflicts and subjectivity and quite an important part of the whole model. The other uh, area we'll talk about is interactions, which are, as opposed to subjective features, interactions are about physics. They're about, uh, or whatever you might care to call it, they're about the objective facts of what really happens, whether somebody wants it to or not. Uh, it tends to be more about uh, laws that are of a, of a uh, uh, engineering or scientific nature. And they have to do with interactions that are exchanges of energy or force or or information or mass that cause changes of state, you know, the kinds of stuff that uh, more technical people are concerned with. And that bridging that gap is a very important part of uh, uh, what system engineering is about because we have to glue them both together and indeed that's why they're associated with each other. So the second point we might make then, uh, passing on, is in the area of interactions, uh, the idea that system engineering, I mentioned earlier, passed through a different uh, emergence as a discipline than the other ones. And that's because of something that system engineers are accused of by the other engineering disciplines, uh, that perhaps system scientists, you, you may find these words familiar to you as well, you might have heard them before. Uh, it goes something like this, that the traditional engineering disciplines were really founded based on the, the hard sciences, like mechanics and chemistry 
and electromagnetics, and we can thank Maxwell and, and uh, uh, Newton and others, Mendeleev, for, for discovering the, the underlying phenomena that are the basis of those sciences and therefore those engineering disciplines. And, and the argument, as it usually goes, usually at, a, at a, a bar where the system engineers are getting beaten up, is that the specialist engineers in mechanics and electrical engineering and chemistry and so forth argue that their fields are based on real physical phenomena with real physical laws and the hard sciences and first principles. Ever heard this before? Right? And, that, and that system engineering lacks those equivalent phenomena-based theoretical foundations. Where's your phenomena? And so usually system engineers are viewed as something like emphasizing process and procedure, which we do, uh, critical thinking and good writing skills, which we do, and organizing and accounting for information, which we do, but not based on an underlying hard science. I don't know if you've heard this before, but I have many times that I got a little tired of it. So uh, this is part of a talk I gave at NCOSI, actually, to try to push back a little bit on behalf of the system scientists. And so we talked about something there called the system phenomenon, and it requires that we understand a thing that we start out with called what's the definition of a system. And the particular point of view that we took for this to define a system is that it's a set of interacting components, which might not be very controversial from your point, but in fact, there are other ways, as you know, to define system, and they don't always have this very same property. When we talk about interacting, we mean exchange of energy, force, mass, or information that causes change of states in the components. And this is meant to align as tightly as we possibly could to the traditional uh, uh, scientific foundations. And so the state of a component, which would evolve because of its interactions, and then that impacts its behavior and future interactions, and that's where the fun begins. And so when we think about phenomena, we suggested that the phenomena of all the hard sciences, mechanics, chemistry, thermodynamics, otherwise, are all special cases of a thing we could call the system phenomena. It's a new phenomena, really a very old phenomena. It's that behavior emerges from the interaction of behaviors, which are themselves phenomena, of a level of decomposition lower. Not a very big surprise. All your discussions about the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and so forth apply. However, the thing we sometimes leave out is for about 150 years since Hamilton's time, we've known that the way those systems evolve in time, the way they behave dynamically, is governed by something akin to uh, Hamilton's principle, uh, or the principle of uh, stationary action, or at least action in different forms you'll hear it in, that describes how that complex holistic behavior evolves in time, and really comes out of the calculus of variation. And so the result of that, if you happen to be mathematically inclined, is that Sometimes there's a bunch of equations that often can't be solved anyway, uh, or empirically observed paths, but they provide physical laws that are subject to scientific verification. And in fact, depending on how you were taught chemistry or physics or other technical areas, often this is used as a path of deriving those other areas, even, even in the, after the quantum revolution, it's still the case. So the point of all this is that instead of system engineering lacking the kind of theoretical foundation that the hard sciences has, in fact, all the other engineering disciplines and all the other hard sciences are borrowing our system phenomena for their phenomena, and they're the ones that don't really have a, a unique phenomena. Uh, it was provided by the system engineers and system scientists. Examples of this, if you want to dig into them, are chemistry, which arises out of electron and other interactions, as, as you know well. Valence electrons and other behaviors uh, give rise to emergent ideas like chemical reaction rates and periodic table and otherwise, or the gas laws that arise out of particle and other interactions, gives rise to all, you know, Bernoulli principle and all the other gas laws that go with it, fluid flow, that are thought of as hard principles, but in fact are emergent out of lower level system interactions. So the view that comes out of this is that, uh, represented on the, uh, on one side, on the left side, is that the traditional physical view of things is that there are underlying primary physical behaviors that have underlying primary studies in physics and chemistry and so forth, and they lead to traditional engineering disciplines. And then we lay the system engineers over the top of that to kind of coordinate things and make sure they all fit together. And what we're suggesting here is that's kind of upside down. That if you turn this thing over, the proper view would be that there was one thing at the bottom called the system phenomena. It's the idea of behaviors that emerge out of interactions. And from that comes the system engineering discipline and system science. And then emerging from that, as we specialize it further, are the traditional engineering and scientific disciplines. And that's all meant to be an argument that you could maybe win at a bar. But the point of this, that's really a practical point, is above that, there are emerging higher level systems yet, 
that have higher level system sciences and disciplines to them, that's quite a practical point and represents some new fields that have come out in the last few years. But we'll come back to that a bit later. A third point to make about this meta model and way of thinking about things has to do with selection, something that uh, Rick discussed a little bit earlier today, and the notion that uh, interactions associated with features represent the idea that uh, certain physical behaviors, interactions between people or, or elements or other components uh, have value or negative value represented by stakeholder feature space. But that likewise, in some of the higher level emergent patterns we'll look at, uh, selection emerges as, a, as itself a system property of a larger scale system. And selection and deselection becomes part of this as well and ultimately becomes the emergent scheme by which value and purpose and fitness arise in these models. Uh, part of the emphasis of S patterns is to have very complete stakeholder feature models. And that, not just think of things like customers for physical products, for example, but the whole stakeholder set that you were talking about in some of the questions earlier today, representing society, uh, certainly shareholders perhaps as well, but local communities and otherwise. And the effect of this is, is manifold. Uh, it means that feature space becomes the ultimate scoreboard by which we can justify and, and argue about decisions and actions and judgments on one set of books. It becomes what engineers call a trade space. It becomes a way to express the notion of selectable options and configurable systems and systems of systems. And in fact, the features become the basis of system selection as well as being formed by it. Also, features become the point in which we express all risks because if we have all the stakeholders accounted for, the only risk can be risks to stakeholders, and so they're all present in the features as well. This has all kinds of effects in collapsing the models we have to look at into simple enough form that at least, even though they're still complex to deal with, we have it all in front of us. When we start using these things to model things, not only products, but, but socio-technical processes like, like development processes, for example, we include a thing called the system of innovation pattern, which is the pattern that emerges out of systems that are themselves uh, processes of innovation, whether they're in nature or practiced by system engineers, engineered systems or otherwise. And, and we begin to see things like the purpose discovery loop, which is a popular idea these days in, in business. We know that these days, instead of having gigantic business plans, as, uh, as uh, our speaker talked about on the first day, that business plans aren't exactly the way to go anymore, just do it. The, the equivalent notion of this in business these days is something called pivoting, which is the idea that instead of writing a giant business plan, you put together a thing called the minimum viable product, go out in the market, and then find out what it really should have been. And that also includes the notion of discovering that you didn't even have the right purpose in mind in the first place. So it's a discovery process, and it's very much represented by these types of, uh, types of models. Uh, for those interested in it, if you dig into this underlying pattern, without going into lots of details of it here, you find what appears to us at least to be, it's in some of our earlier in COSI publications, uh, four recognizable causes in a loop that's part of the process of discovering value and discovering uh, uh, purpose. So lots of interesting things about the innovation process. The, the connection I wanted to make, and maybe to, it'll connect to some of our later speakers today, uh, in particular uh, Lynn and John and others, is the idea that different ideas emerge at different levels in these, in these processes. So this slide illustrates the idea that if we start at the top with this primitive idea of entity relationship models. It says we can model lots of things, maybe everything, in terms of the fact that there are entities in the world and there are relationships between them. And we start there, and from that we derive the thing I showed you very briefly, which is the core meta model. At that level, we define things like elementary systems and notions of material cause. But as this progresses further and we specialize it, we develop additional uh, kinds of system patterns, including the system of innovation pattern, and the notions of fitness and value and purpose and stakeholders and agility and final cause and formal cause and efficient cause and intelligence, management, science, living systems all begin to emerge as higher level patterns. And eventually we get to patterns that are more of interest to us as system engineers that are our sometimes commercial or socio-technical patterns that have domain specific languages and are again blossomings or unfolding of this progressively more and more unfolded uh, pattern framework that all begins with the entity relationship idea and the S meta model. In, uh, in COSI, we recognize something that Rick Dove referred to by number today. It's called the ISO 15288 standard. If you're interested in kind of crossing the divide and learning a little bit more about that, it's not too long. You can take a look at it and you'll see it has uh, 
some 30-some roles in it that are performed by system engineering that are not all technical by any means. Some of them have to do with discovering a value. Uh, and some of them are, are more technical. One of the questioners asked about requirements this morning, very important part of it, as well as the rest of lifecycle management. And those all appear in various ways in a pattern that we're making use of in the project that Rick described today, which is meant to discover what do we mean by agile life cycle management. It's called the agile uh, system life cycle pattern in which closed loops, and it, that includes, uh, you'll find the modeling relation if you dig into there a bit, represent the idea of three different systems. Uh, system one is a target system of interest that we want to engineer or improve or intervene with. And in this picture, it's in a sort of simplistic way shown as some uh, Legos, but it could be a, a complicated socio-technical system for that matter, and its environment. Uh, system two is, a, is uh, a larger system that includes all the actors that are part of its environment, as well as especially all the life cycle management systems that conceive of and change and maintain and manufacture and make use of and are served by uh, the target system, including what we learn about it over time as we get smarter and how we take advantage of that. And system three, farther to the left yet, is the system that worries about improvements in system two, which might seem like a very abstract idea, but I'd suggest to you it's exactly what the IEEE is and what ECOSI is. We're really concerned with improving how we do systems engineering or system science and what we're learning about that, which is really a system three idea. So what I learned in the sessions earlier this week are that most of the concerns we have and have expressed here are really system two and system three problems not system one problems, and as several of you said, maybe we don't need more science done about things like the environment. We need to get on with it, but I'd suggest there's still a lot of system uh, two and three concerns to have. All right, something we'll discuss maybe uh, in an afternoon session if you're interested in it is this idea of trajectories in space, because once you have all these things in hand, you can, uh, you can think about models of trajectories of systems and how they evolve over time. So I'm going to stop there, I think, and. Uh, let our next speaker have some time, okay? Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I'm sure we've got lots of questions and comments. Um, we'll try and drop some in into the cracks, but um, today we tried to give you as, as broad a perspective as possible, so I've packed it in with speakers, and we're gonna fill up most of the time, maybe have five or, five or so minutes at the end for questions. But then we will carry on immediately after lunch in Benson 180, so for an hour and a half, if anybody, if you would like to come along, we can discuss these topics further, and we'd like to hear from you, hear your comments and your uh, suggestions for how to take this forward. Um, the next person up is uh, Elaine Troncali, uh, and he's gonna talk about systems processes theory um, and the way in which this is having an impact now in academia. Thank you all for attending. Uh, so, the session is prospects, new science based, uh, prospects for a new science based system synthesis. And I'm going to use systems processes theory um, as the uh, key focus. So, my systems engineering friends, how many systems engineers are still here? Raise your hand. Oh, good. There's quite a few. Uh, they taught me to bluff. That means bottom line up front. So that's what I'm doing in my first slide. James Martin and the System Science Working Group of INCOSI would be delighted. Uh, I'm going to introduce systems processes theory as a candidate general systems theory in a system science. And on the way, I'm going to present a model of models, just like Bill has. And I agree with you, Bill. There are a lot of similarities. So we're going to try to look at how systems processes theory actually accomplishes a new scientific based system synthesis, and so provide kind of an overview, umbrella vision of needed work. Now science means testing, experiments, data, evidence, literature, but as many of you have said, that kind of data has to move to wisdom, right? Ultimately, for those of you who are so interested in systems level values. Well, for us, it means patterns. And we would say that nature has tested systems for us already for 14 billion years and we should take advantage of that testing to devise a number of isomorphies uh, that are already proven, so to speak. So in a sense, we're talking about patterns like Bill was talking about. <coughs> SPT shows we can prove isomorphy scientifically uh, because it moves from uh, and becomes a system science-based general systems theory. 
And of course, that's what the society was based on, is the formulation of a general systems theory. So we would say there's a huge value from adding the vast natural science literature, which generally is not done at all in this society, or very little. And so I'm going to talk about that. In my humble opinion, the work of IEEE is way out of balance and needs to do more system science. It now does mostly systems thinking. So let's see if you agree with that at the end of this talk, or at all. Systems processes theory captures uh, and uses scientific literature and adds, my technical friend here, there's a problem here. This thing here is in the way of my reading my slides. I can't even read them. This part right here, can I just close that? Or will I, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so technical. <laughs> Everyone laughs, very good. So system processing captures and uses scientific literature and adds many spin-offs or application tools, potentially in addition, uh, from GST and system science. So those are the claims um, that we have bluffing right at the beginning. Let's see if we can uh, actually prove them. So what are the fundamentals of SPT? There's two main things, isomorphies and interactions among isomorphies. Isomorphies, of course, means the same form, function, or action across dramatically different domains, across all known mature systems, physical, biological, and human. This society tends to focus on the human, but SPT focuses on the other two in addition. It must, uh, isomorphies, in order to see them, you must abstract sufficiently from real systems to see or grab the similarity. Uh, this means you must escape the tyranny of particulars and yet remain accurate. Now, the escaping the uh, tyranny of particulars is very, very difficult for humans. And so I talk to you as an alien. Consider me a 40-year uh, alien who is uh, trying to communicate with you. Isomorphies originally proposed by the GST founders of course, but they were never really realized. Bert Lanfey bragged in a Miserovich conference that the same, over the last decade or so, the same seven isomorphies were still standing. And I wouldn't consider any of his really isomorphies by the current definition. We've gone a considerable distance from that time. Still recognizing him as the founder, though. Isomorphies are derived from very detailed and rigorous comparison across many systems, as I said, physical, the living world, and the social world, and the symbolic world, too. So essentially, there are scientifically studied universals of systemness uh, on the levels that they can be scientifically studied. So the second main thing is interactions among isomorphies, and I call them linkage propositions. They were never really formalized by the founders at all. So, SPT indicates uh, how many of the isomorphies really influence the other ones in very specific, scientifically supported influences uh, that we can express in formal format. So the SPT could usher in a new era of GST based on system science, in my humble opinion. Linkage propositions express the essence of systems dynamics and function. They also reveal many types of dysfunction and nonlinear causality, giving much more detail to that umbrella vague term. So let's try to get into this. Three key questions. What is an isomorphy? Although you all should know this very well since you're in the society. Why is it important to a new science of systems and GST? And what is a linkage proposition? Look at these objects in nature. First, what do we mean by isomorphy? Although on the surface these many objects originated at different times in widely different scales, are made from completely different parts, and appear to be very different from artificial systems in the upper right corner, like a, a CPU, to the nucleus of an atom, to a protein interacting with DNA, to a cell, to a full galaxy. When you go beyond, let's do that again, their particulars and rigorously abstract to their general dynamic structure and function, and compare them, you find that they're very much fundamentally the identical key processes and dynamics. And this is where we would get a set of universal patterns for a general system theory. Now, we can ask the scientists, who usually look down their noses at us, why? If their origin times, parts, and mechanics are so completely separate and different from each other, why do these things keep coming up that are the same patterns? Note the conventional natural sciences cannot even address this question, even though it's from their own observations because they focus only on the local. They don't do the comparisons, right? 
So this is a question that belongs to us and is the basis for our actually our arguments with them uh, to some degree. So this unified systems processes theory states it is because the systems processes are simultaneously the multi-parameter minimal case for resources and maximal case for sustainability, one of the themes of this conference. And so after long periods of probability, they automatically fall into these patterns. This is dramatically revolutionary. That means not the particulars are real in this universe, but in fact, the abstract isomorphies. That's weird. I mean, you should think that is really weird. We're saying that real systems are just spin-offs from relationships that are necessary when you have this set of universal laws that we have so far. That is bizarre. OK, so I, I feel that I've argued enough for bizarreness from the alien point of view. Focus on such isomorphies is truly transdisciplinary and science-based, which is really what David wanted to make the point of, right? But when you look at the current situation, most of our universities, publications, government, everything is silo thinking, not only in the sciences, but even in engineering and problem solving, even across many subgroups doing one project or many departments in any corporation. And that leads to many of our current problems. You have things, uh, communities, tribes like physics, geology, biology, the social sciences, and they tend to stay within each other. Now, SPT overcomes this separation by looking at things that are universal to all of them. Feedbacks exist in all of them, hierarchy, cycles, self-organization, fractal structures, and many more. Now, these are scientifically based and detailed isomorphies nowadays because we have large communities that have researched them that provide both descriptive, which is the beginning of every science, and prescriptive dynamics of how systems work and how they don't work. But they're true of all heretofore separated silos. So they mediate the much needed unification, synthesis, and integration of nature and humans, which is the heartfelt desire of this society and its goal. Here is a panel of 20 uh, different scales uh, in our current uh, cosmos. And if you look at them, they show that uh, the isomorphies have been tested from uh, subatomic particles 13.7 billion years ago to astronomical objects uh, in a hierarchy 13.5 billion years ago to planetary systems 4.6, uh, the first living systems 3.2 billion years ago, uh, eukaryotic cells 2.5 billion years ago, multicellular organisms 600 million years ago, and ecosystems on the multicellular level because I keep reminding my colleagues that ecosystems existed for billions of years before multicellular ecosystems. There were unicellular ecosystems that ate each other and lived off the sun and on chemicals. Amazing, the entire range is studied by different sciences using different tools, techniques, but only as silos and stovepipes, which has led to the fragmentation of our current knowledge base. But what if we study across all scales and all domains to find the isomorphs for system science? through the power of comparative systems analysis and rigorous abstraction. And then we would see that feedback, cycles, hierarchies, fractals, flows, networks, synergy, duality is current and, and provable on all of those levels. How impressive is that? So SPT finds and tests for isomorphy by comparing real systems. First, it does it by comparing within a domain, like in biology there you have several sets of phenomena there that show hierarchy feedbacks and cycles. But then we go further and compare across all the sciences, physical including, looking for common processes. And that unifies and integrates simultaneously. But we're using the rigorous techniques of each discipline. The abstraction is a secondary thing. So this should generate greater respect and acceptance for GST, which up to this point, let's face it, by the scientists has not been terribly uh, respected. Well, the result is about 110 isomorphic systems processes in SPT. And obviously, I can't go through all of them in 25 minutes here, right? So um, I'm just pointing out that there's many of them. In this particular slide, there's only 82. But at the present time, we have about 110. In a paper in Systems Research and uh, Behavioral Sciences, we bro broke it down to 55. And now I have to go back to the 110 because I found that that lost too much of the resolution. 
So, systems processes theory is based on science, and science studies processes. Why processes? Because I got in trouble with the systems engineer. They didn't like me focusing on processes. They wanted me to focus on structure. Well, humans are really good at seeing structure. But as soon as it comes to the interactions, it gets much more difficult, and that comes much later. So most of the sciences are descriptive in the beginning. Geology and biology were just descriptive until they started looking at these phenomena. Well, let's look. Oh, this is supposed to be all at one time because I wanted to save time. <laughs> But if you look across physics, geology, chemistry, and astronomy, and math or computer sciences, by studying the processes, they've done very well. You all know the funding for the conventional sciences is the big funding, right? And the biggest departments at the university. Because by looking at these processes and being able to interpret how they work, they've given us handles on how to manipulate the world, and that's the products that we're getting in engineering and so on. Very, very good, and it's, you very nicely pointed out how they think the sciences are the basis for chemical engineering and so on. I'm doing the same argument you were doing, Bill. I'm saying system science is the basis for the natural sciences. You guys just haven't figured it out yet. And you'll be getting stronger hypotheses when you start learning system science than you are now, and you won't have blinders on in addition. But I can say that to you. I'd be booed if I was saying that in cell and molecular biology. So our business is comparing processes across disciplines. Well, I still say, say systems processes theory is based on science. It yields more detail also for each candidate systems process. Look at this. At the top, you see, can you see my, yes. Uh, on the top here are, and in the columns, are the isomorphic systems processes. And you can see that we have got lots of particular cases of them. If you're an astronomer and you're only interested in that, you can look across here and see all the different systems processes. You get it? And so I have an educational program that uh, every time I click on one of these, it goes into the phenomena. So I say I can teach general education science much better than any one of the conventional courses in oceanography or basic biology and so on, because I'm showing the similarities across all the sciences, and I'll talk about that this afternoon when we talk about systems education, later this afternoon. The natural sciences do not use their data laws and theories to expand system science, but we can. They'll probably bitch about it, but we can. Each case study could add significantly to our understanding of each system's process if we look at the details of that literature. But IEEE doesn't even include the physical and living systems most of the time. Look at James Sims there has been continuing Miller's living systems analysis for years. Very few others even go to the sessions. And that's the best system science, in my opinion, in IEEE besides, of course, my own. Uh, <laughs> goes without saying. But, uh, and the same thing for Odom. There's a whole society for Odom, but you don't see any follow-up of his models here. And they're very good energy models. Oh, the time machine could not deplete the backup. Oh. Uh-oh, I hope. Uh, oh, it will, see. He says, just be patient. The technology will catch up with you. So we can also prove isomorphy. And, and the founders didn't even think about doing that because it was much earlier. We can go to these various sciences like astronomy and physics, and all of these are case studies. I had this as an action slide, but to save time, I, I put them all on one page. And then on this one, I'm going to do each one. So the science of geology, we can talk about biogeochemical cycles and show how they have the identifying features of a cycle isomorphy and look at specific ones like oxygen and carbon, uh, and there's a dozen of them now, or look at the uh, oscillations in uh, which are cycles in uh, uh, temperature across the earth and uh, movement of the oceans. We can look in chemistry at the Belosov Zabotinsky reaction, which is at the same time an autocatalytic reaction, a self -organiza organization reaction. It has a non equilibrium thermodynamic reaction, which is, oh, I have stories about that, but we'll have to ask about them uh, in. Uh, the discussion session in the afternoon, right? So uh, all of these have the same identifying features. That's why they're all pointing to the identifying features we use. Uh, or you can look at the life cycle of organisms. Uh, you can look at the 
uh, cycle of uh, every cell that divides in your body. I wish I could go on in that because that's what I studied for 40 years. The Krebs cycle and so on, uh, human uh, activity and ecological cycles. Uh, you get the idea, right? So there's many, many different examples, and it's summarized in the next slide, if it'll just get to it. So can there be a science of systems? Yes, because we have tested for isomorphy. In this case, I now have about 77 case studies across eight science disciplines with empirical evidence from their own empiricism. How can they deny that cycle is isomorphic, as proven by their own data and scientific method? So that's, David, the science basis for general systems theory. It's proving isomorphy. So what was I saying at the bottom there? It was important. Come on. SPT does this for each isomorphy in the GST, and I think so should the ISS. That's why I started the SIGs many years ago. Each SIG was supposed to be on an isomorphy, and they were supposed to do deep, deep research and report every year. Instead, we got systems applications SIGs that don't have the theory that they apply. That's a common theory anyway. Um, and so it kind of didn't work. Now, another, what? Oh, okay, I thought you were going to say five minutes and get out of here. <laughs> System science can be enriched by the scientific literature and it's not using it. These are some of my students who did 10 year to 30 year studies of the literature. And look, there's uh, from thousands, hundreds of thousands to millions of papers on the isomorphies. There's just nine isomorphies here or so. so the student posters uh, next to the registration desk in CC, ECCR, uh, which no one has looked at yet, look at nine ISPs for nine, I mean, uh, look at, uh, yes, nine ISPs uh, representing the 110, and the students have looked at the trends across the year. And you know what we found? It's kind of interesting. We found that the social sciences have less knowledge of most of these isomorphies than the physical and living systems. And yet most of you look in the social systems literature. Duh. Maybe there's a message there. So um, we used either comprehensive or specialized databases that went through all the domains and looked at year by year totals. And that gave two large numbers. I mean, the students, what are you going to do? Look 300,000 papers up? So I suggested they match it with sustainability or some issue in systems engineering and they got much more manageable numbers, but they were still too large. So, and this is, uh, Rick Dove still in the audience? Rick, raise your hand. Oh, good. This is for you, Rick. I found out by looking at Software Engineering's manifesto that was adopted later by Systems Engineering as its manifesto for Agile Engineering, that really all of Agile, Agile Engineering is based on about seven isomorphies. You're shaking your head. We have to talk about this later. So if Agile Engineering hadn't been recognized as a buzzword for many papers and stuff in systems engineering, and if people followed the isomorphies, they would have had to invent it anyway. So it's an interesting thought, anyway. We don't buy the manifesto. Pardon? We don't buy the manifesto. Oh, shoot. <laughs> that was the easiest. That's very good, Rick. So anyway, we, we suggested, well, we've got five minutes. And I've got 26 slides, so I, <laughs> I'll stop whenever. Suggested searches for the word only in title rather than in abstract and text provided more specific hits. And as I said, if you can match them with specific topics like agile engineering, you get a far uh, smaller number of doable papers, as you can see here. So I did fractals for the students, and I discovered if I put reviews in there, reviews only, I got some beautiful papers, just a dozen a year, which is doable. Things like fractals in geology, which summarized a couple hundred papers, or uh, the, uh, the universe as a fractal, which summarized hundreds of papers. And that's the way to do it, I would say for you, if you want to do it in the future. So in my humble opinion, systems thinking tools without system science literature is incomplete. They can enrich themselves and do much better if they start looking at things like systems processes theory. Now, you can also use this framework to unify the systems literature. You see, I do a lot of at-a-glance things here, and here you see Clear, Odom, Miller, Bertolanffy, and Prigogine, their books compared with systems processes theory. And you see, in some cases, they don't have anything 
about one of our proposed isomorphies, but in other cases, they're very, very good coverage of it. You get the idea? Mobus and Calton, are you here? Raise your hands. Nearest book to anything I would advise is system science. So right now it's the reigning book until I can get mine out, of course. <laughs> but it would be different, I think, anyway. But they have many more isomorphies than most systems engineering texts. But there is a whole systems literature out there, Beer's work. Uh, we could uh, cite so many. I have a list of 90 people that are sources for the systems literature. You can abstract out some of their stuff into this framework, too, to try to get one framework. We have 26 sets of information on each isomorphic systems process going into a massive relational database. I want to go through these. Identifying features and functions are the most important because they help students see them in a new domain. Uh, but there's also proof of isomorphy, linkage propositions, pathologies, dissonance, things that come from this work. But for students, the brief history, workers, institutions, funding agencies, and bi bibliographies would be most useful, right? So we're trying to collect all this information. Let's just look at features, for example. Positive, this is for self-organization as one isomorphic process. It requires and is based on positive feedback, amplifications, new pattern formation. It's usually spontaneously happening, bottom-up driven, decentralized, large numbers of coupled individuals. It uh, results in networks and results from networks. It has simple rules that lead to complex results, recursions, that's a very important one, coupled negative feedback, dissipation, sometimes involves nucleation, I could go on. Stimergy is really an ecosystem's concept for it. So we have 14 features which taken together define the thing instead of definitions. So, you know, to define an apple in your head right now, when I say apple, you think of a shape, you think, is it fruit, right? Uh, I get that wrong all the time. Red, perhaps, except the ones that are green, <laughs> and, and so on. And it said, this is how your mind uh, engages with the concept of apple. It has a series of memes that are put together for that super meme, for that word. And the same thing goes for features. But now, look at what we found. One minute. Oh, well. You're not going to get some of the best stuff, but... The symbol, yeah, the afternoon is not, uh, let's use this symbol for feedback, this for cycling, and this for self-organization. This might be the map of, or the landscape of feedback identifying features. This is the map for cycling, and this is for self-organization. Now notice, it's the difference between them that distinguishes that isomorphic systems process, but we keep finding overlaps. Where, like in self-organization, one required networks, positive, negative feedback. And this indicates that they're linked. And this leads us to linkage propositions, which are unique to uh, the systems processes theory. Because you can look at the isomorphies as silo thinking also. And then the linkage propositions work across those and uh, are unifying those. So a linkage proposition is a dyad which links one to the other and says how one influences the other. But we found from this that the most popular operator between them is, is a partial cause or is a partial result of, which in logic is unusual. It's usually A causes B, but you can't do that in systems theory. And what you get from that is graphics. Uh, it's, the technology is a little slow here. And these graphics, um, 80s and so on, this is the latest one. And once you get those graphics, you can make them. <laughs> uh, uh, interactive, so you can say, give me all of the um, linkage propositions with, between one uh, particular isomorphy and the whole set, and so on. And then we're linking them to the literature, so you see these are the sciences here, astronomy, physics, biology, and, and their references. So, uh, di okay, I've got to wrap up now. So what I do in that case is I go to this, if indeed it does it, and, oh, Technology, please, catch up with me. And I, I guess I, I think you're doing very well. Nobody has booed yet. I was going to show that there's lots of spin-offs, and there's, I have here 22 specific contributions to the field of systems processes theory. 
and I was going to show that it's quite different from systems thinking, but in the end I was going to say this, just one slide, okay. We're faced with global warming, pandemic montage, world economy montage, all of these are systems problems, and thank you very much. Um, the systems of systems problems and the wicked human crisis problems we're facing need a stronger system science and general systems theory. So please consider working and learning systems processes theory or your favorite system science like Miller or Odom or somebody like that, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Len. Um, I guess you've all heard of big history, and now you've heard of big narrative. So we only just started to get into the really interesting stuff, but uh, the rest of it will be there available this afternoon. If you come to Benson 180 after lunch, uh, we can get into this and some of the other work a bit more. Uh, our next speaker is John Kinneman, who is uh, obviously familiar to all of you, um, and he's going to be talking about systems research as the general topic and then the specific instance of the par holon theory uh, within that framing. Thank you, John. Greetings. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, last year I did a paper for ISSS, which I ended up withdrawing. It was a paper where I attempted to explore the relationship between uh, my own theoretical work and Len's work. But since Len didn't come to the meeting, we felt that it wasn't uh, fair to discuss it or even feasible to discuss it. But after hearing your presentation, Len, I, I'm even more committed to trying to find a correspondence and a synergy between, between our approaches. And thinking about that, if I were to title this thing, you know, which I wrote in the last hour, um, it would be the hard, soft connection, because I'm trying to come up with a, what might qualify, <clears throat> we'll talk about this, as a super linkage proposition. Um, it, in other words, it's a meta model. Um, a meta, uh, it's a meta isomorphy, I think, uh, composed of explanatory types. So it's a little bit different than looking at behavioral patterns. It's looking at underlying causal patterns. And if it works, the possibility then is to exp give some reasons why some of the linkages that Len is uh, looking at might happen. So we're trying to get to a uh, parsimonious general meta model that can be applied to organize science and scholarship about any system that we want to consider holistically. It's very similar to participatory action research. We discovered this uh, in developing a book, uh, which is, was intended to come out for this conference, but uh, the, the publisher kind of messed it all up, so it didn't arrive. Uh, on systems research, edited by Mary Edson, um, with uh, a number of co-authors, including myself. Uh, but in particular, the, what, what drove inclusion of this framework that you see here in the book uh, was its correspondence with participatory action research, which is a well-known uh, uh, pattern, well-known uh, uh, analysis in the social sciences. Uh, but of course, I'm coming from the natural sciences. and. Uh, Pardon me. And so uh, I also see that pattern occurring there. For example, uh, I'm just going to take one example here. Uh, I see it occurring in, in every discipline that I've looked at. Uh, and it's just a matter of reorganizing the way people have um, conceptually put together the, the causalities, which, you know, in Aristotle's thinking, cause is really ways of explaining something. So when you say, you know, why this? There, you, it, it, fundamentally, it boils down to we have four types of ways of explaining something. And he called, uh, it, he didn't call them causes, he called them ations, and I think it corresponds with the uh, T-I-O-N at the end of many words in the English language. You know, it's like the way, the way of something, you see? <clears throat> so, um, okay, so in this particular case, from the environmental sciences, uh, we have the uh, driver pressure state impact response framework, which is uh, a, a uh, standard adopted by the European Union for environmental assessments. And you see on the left how they drew it. 
And then you see on the right how I redrew it. And it's a, it's a four quadrant holon, holon, just like you saw on the first slide, uh, composed of drivers, pressure, states, and impacts. The response is another cycle. And these are related cycles, just as they would be in a participatory action uh, research framework. And so you can trace on, on the right side, uh, going from a, let's say on the outer, um, let's see, no, on the inner cycle, which is the natural system we're studying, we go from a socio-ecological system context, which is, I, I love what Len said about uh, abstract isomorphy is the real, is, is as every bit as real as the explicit or, or realized pattern. So in the upper side of this holon, we're dealing with the higher causes that Aristotle dealt with. These are final and formal cause. I had to do a little thinking to rearrange those causes so that, so that I would see this cycle. Oh, thank you. Um, because in Aristotle's philosophy, there was an ambiguity as to the position of formal cause, which would be the upper left quadrant, the plan quadrant in participatory action research. There were two examples that are typically given for that formal causation. <clears throat> One of them is the idea of a, of a mold. And you pour molten uh, metal or whatever into a mold, and then you get a statue out, out of the mold. So the formal cause is the mold that forms the statue. In, in that example, you might think that the dynamics uh, precedes, and then the mold then forms, and then you have the material object as a result. But his other example was uh, sculpting the statue of David. And uh, in that example, the question is, well, how do you know how, what to do and how to direct that chisel and hammer? I said, well, I just remove everything that's not David. You see? And in that analogy or example, the formal cause precedes the dynamics because the formal cause is guiding the chisel and the hammer. And I, I, I reasoned that that was the correct way to do it, and that corresponded with ancient philosophy as well, and with all of the frameworks that have emerged uh, through empirical work in many different disciplines, uh, natural sciences in particular, but also social sciences. And Peter Senge's fifth discipline, learning organization, follows the same cycle. So here you can trace it through. The drivers would be things like the need for food and agriculture and development and things like that. Those then uh, result in dynamics, which put pressure on the current system. That changes the state of the system. But it doesn't stop there. You see, the Western science thought of Aristotle's four causes as a hierarchy from top to bottom. So we had to throw away the top. You know? And uh, that was an agreement with the church so that they could take the higher causes, consider them as divine interventions, and science could take the lower causes and consider them as, as pure behaviors that could be observed from a distance. But in the ancient philosophy, it was a cycle. It was never a hierarchy. And, and Aristotle got it from the ancient science of India that came through Egypt. Um, and we just took it apart and made it a hierarchy. Well, that messed up a lot of things. It messed up society, for one thing. Because when it's a cycle, you have the high priests representing the workers. But now we have them separate. And you have disenfranchised people. That's another talk. So let's go on here. So this, the state of the environment, as a result of pressures, creates then what we call an impact. Well, this is the reflect quadrant in participatory action research, right? And so that impact then, of course, create, uh, alters your drivers. And, it's, and it's, a, it's a self sustaining system on just the inner cycle. So that's, a, that's sustainability. It, it's a system that can sustain itself if those various different causes are reinforcing each other. It could also go out of, you know, go haywire and not be sustainable. But that would depend on the external interactions or perhaps even deeper internal interactions. <clears throat> and so those are the things that we want to be able to analyze because we may not want to sustain every system. You know, sustainability, as I said in the Monday talk, is not a universal good if it's science. There might be systems like war that we want to learn how they work so that we can change them. But look at the red arrows here. Now we have a, a, a change process because we have another hole on on the outside, which is the management program. Right? So the state of the environment as a result of various human impacts 
uh, as you saw on Monday with that global dominance picture, um, could then, with the, uh, the red arrow going up, I'll, I'll take, how do I turn this on, Lynn? Ah, button on this. Got it, okay, yeah. So, um, so this arrow now is, is going from the state that, that has been driven by various human action to uh, now a management context. And so maybe we have a, maybe we have a government or maybe we have a, a, an NGO. So, uh, and, and then from that we can get a response plan. It died. <laughs> okay. But anyway, you can follow it on around with the arrows. So then we develop a response plan that, that then can be translated into actions on the ground and changes that we would make, which would be uh, the effect of those, of those actions. And, uh, and then we get a new state of the environment. And now that state can be mapped back into the natural cycle where we've changed the drivers. And if we want to get a sustainable future, this is precisely what we want to do. And uh, in the theory itself, the, uh, what, what you see here are two holons interacting with each other. It's called closure in, in uh, Rosen's theory. And uh, w when you have two cycles that are closed, that's a complex system. It's very much like um, husband and wife trying to redecorate the kitchen or redesign the kitchen. You have two models of the same material system, and that's complex, as we all know. And, uh, <laughs> right? Um, and it, the result of that complexity is, is emergence. When you have two, emergence doesn't come from material interaction, it comes from contextual overlap, contextual overlay. So you're overlaying two contextual models that husband and wife have for the kitchen, and you get an emergent property. Well, it could be a battle, or it could be something very creative and innovative. And if we're thinking about the future, innovation would be uh, where we would want to go. So, um, of course, I can't go into very much detail on these things. But uh, the big missing piece, and, and what got me started in this work, um, yeah, OK. Uh, on the left there, and you see the upper right quadrant on that um, four quadrant diagram, is system potentials. Uh, we know how to model the other three quadrants. We know how to do uh, collect data in the lower right quadrant and build databases. I did that for 18 years with the government. Uh, we know how to write dynamical models, differential equations, and things like that. And this is the, the dynamics, the material, the observable aspect of the system. And we tended to stay there in, in classical science and never really figured out how to go beyond it, even with postmodern science. Um, but then we also have the upper left quadrant, which is starting to get into these higher causes, like yeah, the plan, the design. Well, there's a big debate about design and nature and who, who did the design. If it's a cycle, we don't have to worry about an external designer. It's an internal designer. It's designing itself, and we're participants. Um, but that quadrant is, in fact, represented in, in most of science. It's just we don't want to deal with it very much. We want to kind of ignore it, but recognize that it's important. So in climate studies, for instance, that, that's uh, boundary conditions. And every, every dynamical system has, uh, exists within a context and has boundary conditions. So in the, in the case of climate studies, one of the boundary conditions might be land use and things like that. All, the whole human uh, effect is represented as a boundary condition and it's parameterized. So in a way, we dismiss it just by making a lot of assumptions about it. And we don't, look at, we don't really look at the interaction between the human side and the natural side. Uh, so all of the, but, but we, at least it's recognized, and at least it's represented. And I talked to some climate scientists and, about, well, don't you look at how the interaction works between the boundary conditions and your dynamics? And he says, no, we really don't do that. We just take the boundary as static, and then we work on the dynamics. You know? And we haven't gotten that far yet. But at least it's recognized. When you get to the upper right quadrant, well, that was divine intervention. We wanted to get rid of that altogether in classical science, right? 
So, um, and that's, and, but, but I'm an ecologist, and I'm looking at Hutchinson and, and MacArthur's ecological niche theory. And I say, well, what is this ecological niche? It's nothing less than that upper right quadrant. It's formal cause. It's a, it's a real potential for existence. See, most of science is about behavior. <clears throat> this is about existence. We get rid of behavior. I mean, we get rid of existence in, in classical physics. You know, we push it back to the Big Bang. You know, origin. Now, forget it, because we're only going to deal with what was created, and it can never change after that, in essence. We can't create or destroy matter and energy, according to that view. But now we're finding that we can, because there's strange things happening in the quantum void. And, but those are things that deal with origins and existence. So, so the work that I started doing in India was to look at uh, niche models as a real phenomenon, uh, not just as most of ecology was doing, or almost all of it, a statistical estimation that we as scientists lay on top of the data. So I consider niches real. If there's an ecological niche for bears, you know, and I'm even thinking like an engineer or a classical physicist, you know, like magnets and iron particles, and take the bear away from the niche, it's attracted back. So people might object, oh, that's because the bear has intentions, it has a brain, and wants to go back. Okay, fine. Take the bear out and leave him out of the system. Now what happens? Now something very much like a bear evolves. I mean, this looks pretty darn real to me. You know, if it can't find a bear, it makes one, you know. So, um, so, so that's the missing piece. And once we work out how to, how to do the niche modeling, then we can have a coupled model system, which is exactly what future Earth and current global science is looking for, is how to couple human systems and natural systems. Um, so here you see just, just the con conceptually how it links up the, the data, um, the, the static, the, the behavior that we can observe with the niche potential. And that uh, sort of whitish area there is, is the uh, potentials for uh, Pila globosa, which is a uh, apple snail in India. And the model looks something like this. And these are potentials for the existence of an organism. See? That's very different than the behavior. You can't put space and time into the niche model. It doesn't belong there. It's non-local. Space and time is for local phenomena, which is all behavioral. Um, this is nothing more than you've already seen in the DPSIR example. It's just how two cycles can interact with each other. There's eight ways that they can inform each other. Interact, I try to use that word to refer only to the physical interaction in the realized side, which is the bottom half of this. And at the contextual side, it's more like information uh, exchange. Um, Rosen's uh, diagram for life itself is a causal diagram, but because of the context he was living in at the time and the kinds of peer review that would be obtained, he was focused primarily on demonstrating that there's something missing in the strictly classical view that would look only at efficient entailments, which are state and dynamics. So basically, this is a diagram of what life would look like if we looked only at the relation between state and dynamics, these arrows, which are um, efficient and material cause arrows. And what he showed was that it would have to have this kind of structure, uh, except he didn't show the phenotype and genotype. That was my addition. Um, it would have to have this kind of structure in order to be a living organism. And this structure can't exist in a strictly mechanistic, classical science world, worldview. Uh, so he was, he was demonstrating the necessity of something more, which, which are relations, like I've just been trying to describe. So I first looked, OK, what if I took a whole-on view of this diagram? The, the first simplest thing I could do is look at structure and function, which are two aspects of the whole-on. So every node here has to have both structure and function. Functions map into structures, structures map into functions, apply the rules, and it works fine, except that I have 
it shows that there are four arrows coming from the environment that aren't represented in the diagram. Well, he never intended to. He was only showing what was in the organism. He wasn't showing the relation to the diagram. So now I'm, but, but simply considering each one of these nodes as holons, it turns out that the diagram says you must have, this, a living organism must have a phenotype and a genotype. So I consider that some confirmation. And it's a fifth order holon because once you add those others and the environment is one holon itself, you have one, two, three, four, and then the environment there's five. So it's a fifth order closure, and that's what this is. This is the same diagram as the one you just saw, except now I'm including all the contexts. And um, there's a mathematics to it. It's in category theory. And this last winter, we worked out the mathematics on the right-hand side, which is an inverse entailment. So we know how a function results in some new state, like in the DPSIR diagram, the, the management function results in a new state of the, of the world or of your backyard. Um, but how does a state result in a new function? Classical physics doesn't address it. You see? Well, from my thinking and from this analysis, a state results in a new function if you put it into a new context. So if you take a chair that has a certain function in your living room and you put it in the intertidal zone of the ocean, it's going to have new functions. Not because you change the chair, but because of the ocean, the context you put it in. And so emergence and new functions come out of contextual relation. And that's what the cycle is, it's contextual relation. So this is just showing the most theoretically basic contextual relation on the upper uh, left, which would be an identity. Well, that can't exist by itself, right? Because if it did, you wouldn't know about it. There's no interactions with any other system like you. Two minutes, okay, I think I'm there. And, uh, and then the fifth order hold on is the lower left. The others are in between. There's sequential entailments. There's a whole lot that you can do with this and we're still exploring it. And I'll skip that because that's philosophy and I think David can handle that part. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. We've got two more topics to cover before lunch. You lot were all late by 10 minutes before we started, so I'm keeping you in for another 10 minutes. Uh, no, not really, we'll try to make it up. Um, I've got Jennifer uh, will be next talking about methodology. Jennifer, are you, are you here? Oh, she's here. Still standing up. Barely. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's here on the Thursday folder. Well, you were talking about relations between your holon model and the systems processes theory. And in the systems process theory, one of the isomorphic system processes is potential uh, fields, just like yours, yeah. potential spaces. Okay. I'm not sure I can formulate the right answer on the spot, but I, did, I do want to say that Thanks. the next step in yeah. testing what I'm doing is to see if it, it can explain what Len's doing. And underlie it, not, not replace it in any way. I mean, because I think that works absolutely essential. If you're doing some sort of um, underlying meta theory, you have to test it. And what am I going to test it against? I'm going to have to test it against the actual science and behaviors that Len's doing. So that's why I think they're related. Sorry, Dave. No worries. Thanks, John. So Jennifer will be next, uh, and she'll be talking about how system science can help us improve our systemic methodologies. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, we'll have to try and use that. Leave it be. <laughs> okay, this is a, a little, uh, it's a, a shorter presentation about how, how the uh, transdisciplinarity and the general systemology 
project is working on uh, looking at actually at the practice of sy systems methodologies. And uh, this, this is ongoing, it's beginning. Uh, it, it was to have been a bit further along at this point, but um, we're, still, we're, we're still working there. Uh, this one? No. Thank you. Um, in, there are many, many, many people who have drawn systems, uh, maps of the systems universe. These are just a few of them. Um, we've collected in a topology paper um, probably close to a dozen, a dozen of them from all different people who have worked and, and tried to categorize where systems uh, belong, uh, where they've come from, the different ontologies and different, different epistemologies. And these are just a few of them uh, from, from Len, Len Troncali, from Ray Eisen. There's one from Ray who's, uh, he, who's here today as well. Um, so there are lots of different ways of going at and looking at systems and, and, how, and where, how they belong together. And the, what I started out doing and before just uh, what brought me into the team with, uh, with David and Julie and Stefan working on the general systemology was looking at this, this idea that systems, methodologies themselves, and the behavior that's created, the behavior is something, the patterns are, are what I'm drawn to and what, I, and what I see and what brings me into systems. So what are, how, how do you explain these patterns? And in the, system, in the systemology project, obviously going down into ontology and, and below, but also how does the practice of this um, come about? How do we use a, a systems practice to look at systems behavior? And that was, has been a big part of being, um, of coming into it from general systems and hierarchy theory that I've worked on before. And of course, within general systems and within hierarchy, there are all of these isomorphies, all of these system structures, and the systems methodologies that we call systems methodologies, um, you find it very clearly in something like VSM and SSM, but there are a lot of other different methodologies. How, how can you go into them themselves and look for these isomorphies? And that is what, that's what I was interested in doing. Um, this uh, this uh, lady works in um, eco-epidemiology, which is a, a, newer, uh, a newer form of epidemiology. But she says that you have to be responsive, like a spider is in its web, so that every piece of information coming into you, we have to find a way to be as responsive as possible to picking up all of this information and, uh, as we're doing our work, as we're doing our systems methodologies. And she writes that, um, Henry James wrote, that experience is never limited and it's never complete. And we know that. It's an immense, it is an immense sensibility, a kind of huge spider web of the finest silken threads suspended in the chamber of consciousness and catching every airborne particle in its tissue. And that's what we're supposed to be doing when we go out and we practice. Um, so, started to but how would you do that a little bit differently? Um, and a great word right now is transdisciplinarity. And there are several, um, several meanings of that that go around. Um, if I can, I have some de the definitions there. But in the project, we have, um, David's drawn everything from monodisciplinarity, where you know, it's just a single discipline working, multidisciplinarity, where you you maybe choose and maybe mix and match your methods. Um, across disciplinarity, these are, these are an increasing level of interaction between the disciplines and, and uh, an increasing interaction between the methods and hopefully possibly also a recognition of, of um, the isomorphies that work within them. Up to interdisciplinarity, which is, to me, very often... Um, mixed up with a true transdisciplinarity, which to me is something extra. Um, within the project, it's discovered that connects a different ph phenomena, producing a general theory that connects and supplements. It doesn't 
replace a set of special or hybrid theories. But this is the project um, position. I, can, I would like to be able to go further with that because at the moment I don't believe that there is a true way of working in a transdisciplinary function unless you have a general system, unless you recognize all of the isomorphies, and, as lo and while you are still working, you can't, it's not about, basically, it's not about working in better teams of people. There has to be a much, you have to be able to go lower, below, even the epistemology has to sink below individual ontologies to having something that's much more basic and cohesive even underneath individual onto uh, different ontologies that we, that we hold. And that is part of the general systemology project that's, that's upcoming. How am I doing? I know I'm... Um, so within... Um, I'm, uh, it's Irvin Laszlo's work when he worked on... This is his map on uh, the different systemics and specialized disciplines, the ontologies below it, and this underlying reality that that is what we are after. And it's at that lowest level where we'll find a process and a new methodology for working in a transdisciplinary, true tra transdisciplinary function. And it's what we don't have at the moment. And, the, uh, and in here also, um, within the specialized disciplines and the systemics, the systems methodologies that come out from it at the top, and it's all within, all within a GST. And the link between the GST and the, in, this intrinsic order that's, that's implied at, at the base uh, underneath everything. That's what the GST is going after. That's what the different GSTs that have been presented today um, are, are looking for, different, way, different ways of looking at, um, for this um, elusive animal. So the goal in the end is uh, not actually a spider's web, but it's more of a, trans a 3D transdisciplinary web for making and using systems methodologies, and that's what the project's working on. There are there were just recently published several linked papers in the system, Systema uh, that the Bertalanthi Center has uh, produced. Uh, uh, David's put all of those together. So that is an overview of everything that I can only give in 10 minutes. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, I've got just a little bit to say about systems philosophy, and I'm going to try and wrap it up in five minutes or 10 at the most so uh, we don't keep you from your lunch. Uh, find it quickly. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the cumulative development of the idea of systems uh, really across disciplines. Uh, from the point of view of system science, we think that every specialized discipline is studying some kind of system. So it means it's inherent to their work that they are developing and refining an idea of what a system is. They're developing, excuse me, um, they're developing and refining an idea of what a system is. So even if they don't speak the system language and they don't realize they're doing some specialized version of system science, that is what should be going on in any discipline. Now, in the program that Jennifer just referred to, uh, we were trying to create some kind of vision of what a GST might look like in the future. So to try and understand that, we made a general model of what a discipline looks like, and then within that, the general theory of a discipline. On the idea that if systemology exi existed as a discipline, it would look the same as any other science in terms of its structure. And over time, it would answer the same kind of questions that any discipline tries to answer. Um, and we quickly discovered that what really happens within the science is that it tries to answer uh, these six questions. Now, you can work on all of them in parallel, and typically they do, but they depend on each other in the sense that it's easier to make progress with the later ones if you've already made good progress on the earlier ones. So everybody starts off uh, by saying what qualifies them into drawing a boundary, 
figuring out a, a, a language with which to speak about their subject, uh, and coming up with some value system that says, why do we limit our investigation in the way that we do? Um, and then we start asking the real scientific questions where we develop theories, where we ask what subjects are like, how do they work, and how do they come about? Uh, and that last question uh, can really be expanded into a few subsidiary ones. So this is really the complete list, uh, which takes us to not when we say, where do things come from, or how do they come about, first find how the system, how the simplest ones arise, then how the complex ones arise, why and how diversity arises, and only then do we get to the really interesting question, which is why do things work in the way that they do? We know in general as, um, as scientists and as engineers that there are multiple ways in which you can build a system that fulfills the same function, and the same rules would apply in nature. So why do systems engineers build systems in the way that they do rather than some other way that would perform the same function? Same in nature, why does it work this way rather than one of the other ways? And of course, this gets you to think about optimization, it thinks, to think about the values embedded in the environment. So um, it is in this last stage, when you get to 6.4, 6 that you really start building holistic models. In the early stages, when you're just describing what's going on in your world, you encounter complexity, lots of different parts, lots of different properties, but all you can really do is describe. When you start asking how they work, now you're making functional and machine models studying the processes that produce and sustain systems. And this is the ordinary business of science. Once you've got a good understanding of what's going on inside this kind of system that you're studying, you can start doing evolutionary developmental models and really come to grips uh, with how this comes about and how it operates in the world. But it's only when you think about optimization, when you try to minimize the resources that you use and maximize uh, the abilities that you create with your minimum resources, that you are forced to think in holistic terms. And now the environment and value systems become really important. So at this stage in the development of any discipline, they, ought, they um, are forced to think in a way that we want to think all the time. And the positive message about this is that if we don't do system science, everybody else will do it for us. They're all becoming more holistic in, in the process. Um, I will just show some examples here. So here's some papers coming up from uh, systems medicine and from systems biology, where you can see the people in their fields are starting to struggle with exactly these ideas. They're looking for general organizing principles uh, with which they can resolve these problems, and similar to what uh, Bill was doing about general models for underpinning systems engineering. So we're seeing this emerging across the field now. Uh, if we as system scientists can get our act together and figure out the principles and put them out there, we can help all these folk in their specialized disciplines make much more rapid progress. But there's also a counterfoil to this in that if we can bring these people who are already discovering these interests uh, into our community, we can make system science more powerful. So I think we're living in a time now where we can rapidly accelerate the development of system science. We're just beginning to do it, they're just beginning to do it, and if we can all get together, we can get there very, very much more quickly. And that is my message. Thank you very much. Am I on time? Yes. I, I think we owe it to David, since we started 10 minutes late, is to push another 10 minutes into our lunch break, if that's all right with everybody. And that would give you time for a few more closing remarks or questions. Is that all right? Yeah. So, so until 20 after, OK? Thanks, John. Um, I'll just leave my previous slide up there because this is, this is our master work from our work on GSTD. Um, so thank you for your attention. I hope you found the morning interesting. I hope we'll see many of you in Benson 180 after lunch uh, and we can carry on diving into more depth uh, in all of these subjects uh, and explore a little bit how we can take this forward. Uh, for the next few minutes, if we can take a few questions and comments. Andreas at the back. Oh. While he's finding it. Uh, thank you, David. I found that morning uh, fascinating. Um, there's uh, precious work in all of these different fields from engineering, from, from natural science, uh, from a more philosophical and value point, um, and seeing them side by side. So what I would like to hear maybe more even is then the connections where you see like the same different words, where are between these four or five views we have seen uh, um, tensions or similarities. And the other thing is, um, if we would have the same thing again, what would I would like very much that people would in the beginning say, who is my audience? 
so that we see this is an integrated systems view for students in natural science, or this is uh, for engineers. So, and saying what do ha they have kind of needs, characteristics, and what kind they uh, put uh, as away because they don't need it. So that would help better to see the, the, um, the, the, the potential of each of them. Right. Thank you, Andreas. Yes, that's good. good question and a valuable comment. Um, I think on the first on, on the first point you raised, uh, I think Len is our grandmaster on that. He coined this wonderful term dissonance, uh, which are s disciplinary synonyms. So these are the words where different disciplines are talking about the same thing, but they're all speaking different languages. So they've got different terms for the same idea. That's one of the challenges we have to overcome as we develop a system science. It's not bringing people together, but get them to speak the same language. Um, the other part that you refer to um, is really the research agenda for systemology. So we have to figure out what are the key tasks that we're going to do, the strategic activities, and how they link together. Um, we have made a start with that in the GSTD program. So we have a paper uh, in that set that's in Sistema uh, called the research agenda for GSTD. Uh, and we thought when we started out on it, what we would do is make a list of all the important things which we have to do to, if we want to be successful. And we very quickly figured out that that's exactly the wrong way to try and do it. So the research agenda in the end uh, was produced as a set of questions. that says these are the questions that we have to answer, and these are the challenges that we have to address. And it's really up to the people who work, who each come with their own special perspective and their own special set of talents to figure out what is the best way in which they can contribute towards us resolving these questions. So have a look at that paper, and let's, and let's open a dialogue on that and see if we can improve that and make it a, a useful document for our community. Uh, Gary in the back, and then you. So it's building on what was asked in the last question. Um, there is a common theme to, to all of the work that you're doing, and it, it's the, the key terms that we see repeated over and over um, in, in what you were saying and also in all of the literature when people are doing, you know, looking at system stuff or doing systems engineering. It, it's stuff like structure, patterns, cycles, states, function, purpose, context. You know, we see it over and over, and these are the words that we use constantly when we're communicating. But as system scientists, what you've got to do is you've got to agree that key set so that we can all use them and start to speak the same language. Once we've got that language, you can start to define key principles using that language. So please hurry up, because we really need it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, George Bobis is doing a lot of work in that area in ontology for system science. And I think with him, we can all build that into something which we really need. Uh, I know Gary has got a, a piece of work in that area, which we, which we saw presented in Linz in, in, in April. Um, so I think we've got lots of ideas about terminology, but it's one of the big bugbears at the moment, but also a big potential. The more we can agree on terminology, it means the more we start understanding each other's concepts as we think about systems. So it's enriching for us individually, but it's also helpful for us in terms of creating a foundation on which we could build a real discipline. Oh, yes, sorry. Is there a microphone? Yeah. yeah my question has to do with the question of normalizing the systems theories and um, into the political process. Because I have been working for many years in the statistical office, and of course the information that the people receive, in fact, is data or statistics. The statistics, while they reveal some information, they also hide much information because they're very linear and they do not have the complexity that is required to understand the real processes going on. And I, my, feel, I, my feeling is, and I, I can feel this almost intuitively, that you, your real objective function is to not to do more and more refinement of the, of the work that you're doing, but to normalize it into the decision-making processes that s itself, which is really at the top of the governments. I think the closest we have of this now is the European Union in Brussels, and you can see the reaction of Britain to that type of thinking. Mm. Ab absolutely, completely agree with that. Um, I'm focusing strongly on the kind of scientific and data and theories and laws and models aspect of systemology because we have so little of that today and I'm trying to start as simply as possible so that we have a sound basis on, on which to proceed. 
but of course it's embedded in this broader framework that you've described. We have a parallel project going on within the IFSS, which is a joint venture between IFSS and IFSR, uh, led by Mary Edson. Um, it's called Systems Research in the Service of Systems Literacy. And it is really addressing this question of how do you get from having knowledge, how do you get from that point to the point where it's actually uh, in the hands of the people who need to use it? And it means going through the organizations that do the teaching. So they need to be convinced that it's there, that, it's that it works, that it's real, that they have the case studies, and that they have uh, people who can speak to it. Um, so that whole process has been envisaged through a project that was started uh, in, in Linz in the IFSR um, a few months ago. Um, and there was a workshop on it here in this conference. And it will, we'll con we will continue uh, working on that. And they've identified sort of eight stage process and then 10 steps in each of the stages of what do we have to do to take us beyond the science because you also have to think about the maturity of the discipline, the roles and the uh, personas of the people who deliver the work, what is the competency matrices they have to have, how do we develop the maturity of the discipline, and how do you convince institutions and decision makers that this is worthwhile and that they should take it on board. Now, do you bring investment into it to make it, to make it real in the end? So, yes, thanks. thank you for that. It's an important project. And we are just now at the point where we can start thinking about it because we are just now getting to the point of having the beginnings of strong system science. One last. Very few people uh, in INCOSI itself realize that uh, in the chapter, INCOSI chapter in San Diego, there is a group of medical doctors and others uh, in systems engineering and beyond systems engineering that now have started a journal and a regular conference series on the impact of system science on legislation, government, and policies. And I think you'd be very interested in, please write me an email and I'll con get you in contact with them. And in fact, perhaps uh, a SIG, perhaps a, uh, um, a future uh, session might be good for that for the IFSS. Okay. Right, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here and let you go to your lunch. Thank you very much for your attendance and your attention, and thank you to all our speakers. Uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, the posters, if you want to keep your posters, they need to be collected tonight. And also, we have the, the ISSS banquet tonight. Make sure you have that.